Welcome to On the Ballot with Ballotpedia, where we connect people to politics by providing neutral, nonpartisan, and reliable information on our government, how it works, and where it's headed. I'm Frank Festa, and thanks for being with us. Earlier this week, voters in North Dakota approved a ballot measure that will establish age limits for the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives from the state. The Congressional Age Limits Initiative, or North Dakota Initiated Measure 1, as it's also known, passed with 61% of the vote and is officially the first American law of its kind to set a cap on how old you can be to serve as an elected official in our country. Now that the law has been passed, the million dollar question is, what happens next? I'm joined now by Dr. Mark Gendrisk, a political science professor at the University of North Dakota, who's been closely following the initiative's development and the domino effect that it could potentially trigger. Mark, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Mark, you've been quoted and cited in so much of the reporting I've seen on this ballot measure going back months now, including our own reporting, predicting that if this ballot measure passed, it could be a potential test case for the nation at large. What made you think that initially? Well, I think it, mainly when I saw that this was supported by the Term Limits Incorporated group that has been trying to you know, get major changes in how we elect and retain members of uh, state legislatures and Congress for decades. And I think this was driven partially by the success uh, two years ago of a term limits measure in North Dakota for the legislature and the governor. We never had term limits and that was passed very easily uh, and has has become law. So I think they saw North Dakota as a good place to try this uh, and uh, get this passed. And I think that they're ready to get this into the Supreme Court. I think they see the current constellation of the Supreme Court as favorable to the arguments they're making in terms of you know state sovereignty and those sorts of questions. So that seems to be the case for me that, that this North Dakota is an easy place to get on the ballot. Hmm. And it's a place that seems very congenial to the sort of limitations they're looking for. That definitely makes sense. And we'll get to more on SCOTUS in, in just a bit. But now that the law has passed, again, with about 69% of the vote, have we seen any of these related lawsuits set in motion yet? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, it seems like the question of who would have standing. Um, hmm. You know, if I'm just a citizen here in North Dakota, a resident of the state, you know, do I have standing to sue today about this bill? And I don't think so because I'm not running for public office and I'm not 80 years old. Um, my theory is that Term Limits USA is going to find a, a straw man uh, basically in the next statewide election for Congress or Senate. They're going to find some 85 year old guy to put his name forward and say, oh, I'm being, you know, I'm being oppressed, right, by not being able to run. And that they want that, I think, is how they're going to set up a test case because they, I think they will need someone with standing because obviously I don't have standing. I don't even think, you know, the 80 year olds I know in North Dakota would have standing because they're not running for public office. Sure. And it, it, would that be the most obvious hypothetical lawsuit that would have to come from someone who was, you know, running for office, let's say I'm 85 years old in North Dakota and I run this law goes and, you know, comes into play and I can't serve. Is that what would trigger the lawsuit most likely? Or are there other avenues that I might let it develop? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. My wife is, but <laughs> I'm not. And uh, I think, I think standing is the key question because you have to show potential injury, right? And so I'm not injured by this law because I can run for office. I'm still 59. I think you'd have to show potential injury. And I think that's that's what they'd be looking for. So I'm, I'm assuming they're going to find someone to run uh, for these one of these offices who's going to say I'm being injured by this law. And uh, that would, I think, set, you know, set the case in motion. Got it. That, that makes sense to me. And the law technically is in effect as of this week, correct? Yes, uh, I believe so. I, I believe once it's actually just passed by the voters, it automatically goes into effect. You know, in some sometimes when we have referendums and initiatives in North Dakota, the, the, the uh, legislature has to pass enabling legislation or write regulations or something. But this is a very simple one. I think it just goes straight into the Constitution. And speaking of the Constitution, some have argued that this initiative itself is unconstitutional. What's your perspective on that? Well, I would I'd be inclined to agree, given the court's decisions regarding you know the composition of Congress and, and their view that Congress sets the terms for its own membership. That was the judgment in the case in the 90s about term limits. Uh, that's kind of the key case here. Uh, certainly, there, there are recent decisions about how states can't disqualify candidates for federal office uh, You know, regarding trying to disqualify Trump under the sedition clause of the 14th Amendment would suggest states can't disqualify people. But you know, the only member left on the court now is, is Justice Tullibus, right? And he was in favor of term limits in the, in the case in the 90s. 
So we'll see what happens. I wouldn't be surprised if this current court is a little more congenial towards the idea of states setting their own conditions for running for office and holding office at a federal level. And expand on that a little bit, if you, if you don't mind. I know that Clarence Thomas is the only remaining Supreme Court member from that 1995, I believe it was, or 1996 decision 95. that this is directly related to. Any other inkling of how SCOTUS might think about this case and what else they might tie it to or arguments that might emerge? Well, Thomas's argument in his dissent in 95 was that the Constitution was silent on term limits and therefore the states could take action on it. And I think that would be the argument, right? The Constitution is silent about an upper age bound, so states could add. That might be the argument, right? That you know, where states have quasi sovereignty, right, and they can set conditions for office. But it would certainly be uh, a major shift away from their position that they've taken even last year on this kind of question. So we'll see. But I think the states' rights argument is made, and I think you know, Frank, that this would open up a can of worms for all sorts of things. Sure. You could imagine states saying. You have to be born in this state to hold office here, or you have to be uh, you know, a resident of this state for 20 years before you can run for office. And uh, you know that opens up a real interesting set of possibilities, which I'm, I'm not certain the court would want to entertain, but you never know. You never know. That domino effect is something that's really interesting to me. Well, in a broader sense, where do things go from here? I know that they might spill over into different types of qualifications and requirements mm-hmm. for you know, running for any particular office, or maybe instead we might see other states try to pursue something similar? Or what do you think? What might be the next logical, you know, sequence in the action here? Well, I think it, I, mean, I think they're going to go for term limits next at, at a state-by-state basis, right? They're going to say, if we pass this age limit, then term limits should be okay too. And they're going to, I think they're, we're going to see something like that as well. And North Dakota is a great state for this because you need so few signatures to get on the ballot. So if you only need you know, 4% of the population to get these questions on the ballot, it's a great state for this kind of test. So I, I could foresee the term limits group try to get on the questions on the ballot like this in other states and in North Dakota to, to go with term limits next. Any sense from your end, Mark, of how this has been received on the ground in North Dakota? Are people excited? Are people you know triggered into action by this? What's the story on the ground? Well, it passed with 61% of the vote. So it was very popular, but this was a very low turnout election. I mean, we had a 20% voter turnout across the state. So my view is there was, you know, there was two strong contests in the Republican primary for governor and for U.S. House representative. This brought out, you know, more conservative voters who are likely to favor this. I hadn't seen any much, much reaction beyond the straight reporting of this passing, but, you know, I, I don't think it'll mobilize people. I think it probably won't have any effect until it becomes real which might be with someone holding office who has to leave, although neither of our senators are that old, so it's not likely to happen anytime soon. Or I, I think it's going to be someone who's going to run for office uh, you know, next time uh, there's an opening who's going to be older, and then you're going to see a test case. I think that's what's going to happen, and I, I think that's where I'll put my money in 2026, seeing some sort of test case on this. Okay, we'll have to wait and see. But Mark, thank you again for coming on the show, man. You've been great. We'll have to have you back on the show down the road whenever that lawsuit might develop or if we see anything else related happen in North Dakota. You're welcome. Anytime. Yeah. And for our listeners, please stay tuned. We'll be back in just a moment after this short break to continue on with more of the backstory of this ballot measure with one of Ballotpedia's very own. Stay tuned. Hey, on the ballot listeners. This is Allison from Ballotpedia's communication team popping in to share a little bit about our new Did You Know series. We'll offer one useful or fun political or election-related fact every Friday in Daily Brew up through the general elections in November. Did you know that not only is trivia fun, but it can also help improve your memory, reduce stress levels, increase your knowledge base, and even improve your problem-solving skills. So through November 8th, 2024, our Did You Know series will take center stage replacing our Friday trivia as we lead up to the November elections. So for our very first one, get ready. Did you know that North Dakota is the only state that does not require voters to register? That's pretty interesting. Check out our Friday, June 14th edition of Daily Brew for additional information on voting in North Dakota. And if you're not already subscribed to Daily Brew, our free newsletter, check out the link to sign up in our show notes. Stay tuned and let the adventure begin. Welcome back to On the Ballot. 
I'm joined now by Ballot Measure staff writer Jackie Mitchell to help bring us a little bit into the backstory, more about how this ballot measure got on the ballot and some of the related history. Jackie, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I know it's been a while, so great to have you back. So how did North Dakota Initiative Measure 1 get on the ballot in the first place? This initiative was sponsored by Jared Hendricks and his committee, Retire Congress North Dakota. To get an initiated constitutional amendment on the ballot in North Dakota, proponents need to collect 31,164 valid signatures to qualify. Back in February, the group submitted about 42,000 signatures, and the Secretary of State's office confirmed that the measure qualified for the ballot uh, in March. Generally speaking, is it hard for measures to get on the ballot in North Dakota? I would say North Dakota is an easy state to get an initiative on the ballot. Since North Dakota does not have a voter registration system, the number of signatures required is tied to the population reported by the last decennial census. For statutes and veto referendums, the number of signatures is 2% of the population, and for constitutional amendments, it's 4%. So the requirement for 2024 was just under 16,000 signatures for initiated state statutes and veto referendums, and just over 31,000 signatures for constitutional amendments. And each initiative petition can circulate for up to one year after it's approved to circulate. From 2010 to 2022, an average of seven initiatives are filed and an average of three make the ballot. Got it. And just want to step aside quickly for a definition, Jackie. What does decennial mean? I actually don't know what that word means. Uh, Every 10 years. (laughs) Oh, okay. So every the census from every 10 years. So they use 2020's data. Yep. Now, tell us a little bit more, if you can, Jackie, about the group sponsoring the measure, Retire Congress North Dakota. I know that you mentioned that Jared Hendricks is the gentleman that's behind the uh, the organization, but what's their primary argument as to why this initiative is a good idea? Yeah, so Jared Hendricks also led a campaign in support of an initiative to create term limits for governor and state legislators in 2022. Um, He also ran for state house in the uh, 10th district. So he was on the Republican primary ballot uh, at this election as well. And he advanced the general election. Um, As for who's funding the Retire Congress North Dakota Committee, campaign finance reports show that the committee received a little over $50,000 in cash and in-kind contributions from the national group U.S. Term Limits which advocates for term limits across the U.S. And U.S. term limits also supported his other committee in 2022 regarding term limits. And to be clear, Jared Hendricks is not some disgruntled 85-year-old North Dakotan that's trying to run for the Senate, right? It's not like a personal case for him, is it? Correct. Outside of that, Jackie, do any other states have similar types of laws? No, this is the first measure of its kind. If it's not maybe the first of this kind of law specifically, do any other states have age limits for other positions like judges? So the U.S. Constitution sets a minimum but not maximum age thresholds for presidents and members of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. The minimum age to be president is 35. The age to be a senator is 30, and it's 25 to be a U.S. representative. The Constitution does not set a minimum or maximum age for Supreme Court justices. There are judicial mandatory retirement ages um, in many states, however. Jackie, thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate you bringing us up to speed on some of the backstory here. Yeah, thanks. And for our listeners, you can learn more about our ballot measure coverage at the link in our show notes. We'll be back next week with another episode. Make sure you subscribe to On the Ballot wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Frank Festa, and thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.